I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and I had the honor of accepting this position almost exactly a year ago. As our county executive, Rich Fitzgerald, mentioned earlier this morning, the Institute of Politics plays a critical role in our region because we tackle issues from a nonpartisan and balanced approach, which is absolutely essential when you're convening elected officials and civic leaders, conducting policy research, and objectively analyzing data. I want to take a moment to thank our team here from the Institute of Politics and especially our senior policy analyst, Aaron Lauer, who is over here, who is instrumental especially in this initiative on criminal justice reform. While my work now requires that I do policy analysis, my career began in the Erie County Office of Children and Youth as a Child Protective Services caseworker. I worked in what was called the Intensive Family Services Unit. And there I came to know both the criminal and the family divisions and the many, many professionals who work in both. And so for those of you who are here today who work in either one of these systems, I personally want to say thank you and that we deeply, deeply appreciate the work that you do in our communities. When I spoke to our speaker last night, Stanley Richard, I was quickly reminded of the struggles that my clients faced as they were released, as some of them were released from jail and returned to their lives and their families. He reminded me of how disruptive incarceration can be, how disruptive it can be to their mental health treatment, to their substance abuse treatment, to their employment, their housing stability, and what I saw most was the incredible and traumatic impact that their absence had on their children and the long-term impact that was felt and is probably being played out in their children's lives. So with that, I'm very, very honored to introduce Stanley Richards, who is the Executive Vice President of the Fortune Society, a 52-year-old service and advocacy nonprofit organization based in New York City whose mission is to support successful reentry from, from prison and promote alternatives to incarceration. He can talk about this from a firsthand perspective. His professional experience began in 1991 at Fortune, where he initially worked as a counselor and then between 1997 and 2001, he served as the Deputy Director of Client Intervention at Hunter College, the Hunter College Center on AIDS, Drugs, and Community Health. In 2014, after he returned to the Fortune Society, he was recognized by the Obama administration as a champion of change for his commitment to helping individuals impacted by the justice system. And he also became the first formerly incarcerated person to be appointed by the city council as the by the city council speaker and serves as the vice chair to the New York City Board of Corrections. With that, I'd like to introduce Stanley Richards. Thank you, Samantha. Um, and it is a pleasure to be here this morning. To have a conversation, I just need to turn this on. To have a conversation about uh, criminal justice reentry and criminal justice reform is very exciting for me. Um, just give me one second. It's very exciting for me um, because I lived that life. And there was a point in time in my life when I didn't believe change was possible. And what I did was survive. I learned how to survive. And I thought that my life would be filled with cycling in and out of prison. I didn't see a future for myself. I thought my life was destined to the public housing project I lived in, to the crime and uh, devastation I saw in my community. And I learned how to live that life. So I would get arrested, I'd go to prison, I'd come home, I'd do it all over again, I'd do it all over again. 
because I did not believe that anything else was possible. And it wasn't until my last incarceration that I ended up going to school and I realized that the power of my life wasn't determined by the projects I came from or what I saw in front of me. That the power of my life was in my hands. That yes, I had to deal with the reality of systemic barriers. Yes, I had to deal with the reality of my poverty. Yes, I had to deal with the devastation of my family and my community. I had to deal with those realities. But I knew once I went to college that my life was in my hand, that I could make decisions that would be better for me, for my community, and for my family. And so I come to you today to talk about what is reentry and how do we as a, as a nation, as a community, really think about reentry, work together to help people build lives. And I would challenge you all here today, when you start thinking about reentry and you start thinking about criminal justice, it starts with and ends with language. It starts with and ends with language. And here's why it matters. For the longest in my life, I have always thought that I was the crimes I committed. That the way people saw me and the way I lived my life was based on the crimes that I committed, how aggressive I could be, how isolating I could be, how emotionally cold I could be. And then I realized that the crimes are what I committed. The crimes are not who I am. That I am a good man. That I am an African American man. I'm a father. I'm a community member. I'm a colleague. And when that changed for me, I realized in this movement, in this work, that we all have to watch our language. And we all have to set aside the differences between this notion of violent and nonviolent crimes. And we need to start working with the center of who people are, and that is their people. They are people with convictions. They are people with substance use issues. They are people with mental health issues. They are our brothers, our sisters, our family members. And so at the center of all of our work, we need to watch the language we use. They are not convicts, they are people. So I wanna start by talking a little bit about when we say reentry, we must first understand who we're talking about and the way people experience um, jail and prison. And that is, what happens when people go into our institutions? How is it that we need to be prepared to work with people when they come home? So what does incarceration require? Incarceration requires adaptation. You need to figure out really quickly, and for the, for the warden who's here and the criminal justice uh, folks who are here, they know this. People need to adapt to understand and to survive the experience of incarceration, be it jail or prison. They need to decide pretty quickly whether they're gonna be the predator or the prey. And when you decide that, you make that decision, you're making a decision about how to live your life in that institution. You are making a decision to be emotionally protected, which means you show no emotion. You learn how to live your life without being able to identify how you're feeling on a particular situation or how to express how you're feeling because that's what it takes. You learn that anger and aggression are tools that allow you to survive. It allows you to rise up in the pecking order in the institution. 
you understand how to manage trauma and you manage it by not talking about it, by not acknowledging that it happened to you. You learn how not to talk about your broken family, your children that you left, or the children whose lives you've never been involved in because you was on the street. For many people in our jails, they have not been diagnosed or they have been diagnosed with a mental illness, with a substance use disorder. Those have been issues that have plagued them, that have um, sort of provided the foundation for them to cycle in and out of jail because of those particular issues. Many of the people in jails and prison, as you know, dropped out of high school or don't have the competitive skills to come home and to get a job. They can't be competitive in, in today's um, market. Many people understand that once you go into jail and you begin to believe that that experience is all you're going to get, you learn how to survive that and you learn how to live it. And so what happens when they get released? They have all these expectations from their probation officer, from their parole officer, from family, from many of us in the room that they need to get released, stop using drugs, get a job, go to school, live a law-abiding life. And this is for people who have been wearing the jacket of survival for many years, some for decades, and that's our expectation. And we release them and we say, go be. Go be who we think you can be. And we have a fragmented service system. We have uh, uh, in, insufficient resources available to help many of the folks. But what's good about this room and what's good about this moment is that we are coming together to really think about this and to talk about how do we do it differently. That what we've been doing for all these years to get us to a point where we have 2.2 million people in jails and prisons in our country, we're at a point now where we're saying what we have been doing for the past decades has not worked and we need to do something different. So how do we respond to that? So let me tell you a little bit about how the Fortune Society responded to that. In 1967, our founder David Rothenberg produced a play called Fortune in Men's Eyes. And it was a play written by a formerly incarcerated person in Canada. And it was his story. And in that play, it was an off-Broadway play, in that play, it told the story of his experience. And what was his experience? He was raped, he was assaulted, he was put in solitary confinement, he was brutalized by those who were incarcerated with him, and he was brutalized by those who were there to manage his care, custody, and control. And as a result of that play, audience members couldn't believe what they had saw on stage and began to question whether that play was real. And there was a couple of people in the audience who had recently came home. And they stood up and they said, they used to have a talk back after the play. They said, if their jail and prison experience says anything, it says exactly what that play talked about. And they began to dialogue about what was going on in our prisons. And so David Rothenberg thought, this is an opportunity, and he likes to describe it as a time in his life when you didn't have to apologize for caring. And he said, it's a time right now for us to come together and to be able to give voice to the voiceless. And the voiceless were the men and women who were coming home, mostly men at that time, who were coming home from prison and jail and just trying to make it. And so David started the Fortune Society. And we started as an advocacy organization to address the conditions of confinement 
and the experiences of mostly men at that time in jail and prison. As um, was said earlier, our mission is to support successful reentry. And we think about our mission and supporting successful reentry and ATI, Alternatives to Incarceration, as a means for gaining community safety. Because for every life that we can help get a job, have some stability in housing, get into recovery, every person that we can keep out of the system is savings to the system overall. So it is public safety. Reentry is public safety. And we look at our work like that. And we do this work by three foundational uh, values or statements. One, we do it by believing in the power of individuals to change. There is not one person who walks through our doors who we predict will be successful or won't be successful. Everybody who walks through the door, our starting assumption is that they can change their lives. Given the right supports, given the right um, motivation, people can change their lives. We believe our services should not be shaped by our staff's understanding of what services should be offered or the psychologist who thinks that we need to be providing services in a particular way. Our services are shaped by the men and women who walk through the door. We have a saying in one of our housing um, meetings that Judge Lippman was talking about is that we say the answer is in the room. We believe people come to our space with answers. They may not believe in those answers, but they have a sense of what they need to change their lives. And our services are shaped by that. And then the third thing we do is change minds, educate people. We put a face on criminal justice. Over 50% of our staff are people formerly incarcerated. And so we go around the country talking about criminal justice, talking about what it takes to change, talking about the investments we need to make on reentry and helping people build lives instead of building jails and building prisons. So our advocacy platform is a big part of what we do because we don't want to just be a safety net for people when they come home. We want to stop so many people from going in. Who do we serve? And it's going to be sound a lot like the men and women you serve. 87% of our population, male, 12% female. 18% are between 18 and 24. 25 to 34 is 29% and 35 to 50 is 32 percent. So we serve a slightly older population. Um, and that has been changing over time. We've been seeing more and more young people coming in. But our population are people who are mostly coming from prison, mostly older folks. 85 percent of the people who walk through our doors are unemployed and seeking employment, which is one of the pillars of reentry. If a person doesn't have a job, they don't have an ability to provide for their family, chances are they're going to revert back to what they've always done and what they know how to do, and that is to hit the streets and to go into survival mode. 18% have a high school diploma, 32% have a GED, and in New York, we have done a much better job at providing education while people on the inside, although in 1994 it was eliminated, but now we have a movement to reinstate Pell that will allow people to have college while they're in prison, which is one of the most um, amazing tools we all know that help people change their lives. 11% have some college. 40%, 47% of our participants have children. So just think about that. We see about 7,000 people a year. 47% of them have children. So what are we talking about? We're talking about generational 
incarceration, generational impact, because the fathers and mothers of those children who have cycled in and out, who have, for the most part, been removed from their children's lives because of child protective services or because of disconnection with the um, parent, the, the mother. 47% have children. So when we talk about providing services, we're talking about generational impact. What is our model of engagement? <clears throat> so as a result of all of our advocacy, all of our listening to the men and women who come through our doors, providing the basis for who we, how we see people when they come in, we created a model that has a couple of points. One is that there's no wrong door for entry. That means somebody can walk through any of our service doors and get access to all of our services. Before we started with our licensed outpatient mental health program, we used to refer people out. And what happened? People took the referral, they went to maybe the first appointment, and they never came back. And so what we created is a one-stop shopping model for people that they can come in with whatever need that they consider to be the most presenting or pressing need, and they could get access to the entire Fortune community. That is lifetime aftercare, holistic services, and the level of engagement people are ready for because we don't, we don't force the readiness piece. The other thing we have is very low threshold. Many programs, and, and this is partly driven by government funding, the funding structures, many programs have eligibility criteria that people have to meet before they can come in and get access to services. As an organization, we make a commitment to people that regardless of what you're eligible for, if you walk through our doors, you're gonna meet with somebody, you're gonna be welcomed into our community, you're gonna meet with a counselor, you're gonna get an assessment, we're gonna to talk to you about what you think you need, we're gonna to talk to you about your experiences, and we're gonna figure out how to get you connected to whatever service you need. You don't need to fit into our box. We need to be able to be flexible enough to meet your need. And that element is so critically important. And as you build out your program, I would implore you to make sure that you have that low threshold element. Because here's the reality. When people walk into your door, even if it's because the probation officer sent them, the parole officer sent them, or they, in their own mind, said, I am tired and I want to do something different. When they walk through your door at that moment, that's the moment you have to be ready to engage them. You can't tell them to come back. You can't tell them they're not eligible. You can't tell them to go someplace else. You have to seize that moment of readiness and engage people. The third thing we do is we make a lifetime commitment to folks. Once you are part of the Fortune community, you are part of the Fortune community for life. It doesn't mean you have to receive services for life. It means you have a place always when things are going well to come and share with us how things are going for you. We encourage people when things are going well and they have re rebuilt their life to come and share with others so that they could be a role model and motivator to show others that it could happen when maybe they're at their lowest moment. We also tell people that when you are in your transition and your stresses happen as they will, don't wait until after you take a particular action. Come in before you take an action. Walk in outdoors, pick up the phone. That's the lifetime commitment. What is our service model? As I said, we started as an orga uh, advocacy organization where our mission was to educate people and change policies and change conditions of confinement. But as a result of that, we have been hearing, well, we need a job, I need a place to live. 
I need to get back to my family. And so we've built out a holistic service model, and I want to go through some of the services we have to bring about a holistic model. One, we do discharge planning. We are in nine, eight of the facilities on Rikers, soon to be six because we're closing uh, two more. We are in all of the facilities on Rikers Island and in the borough house. We are in the housing areas providing individual and group services. We are engaging with their family while they're in. We don't wait until they get released. We'll call their family. We'll find out what the family may need because we understand that when someone gets released, as happy as the family may be, someone coming back home is a stressor. I remember when I was coming home and it was great for the first four or five days. My father was really happy to see me. He was glad I was home. But when I wasn't bringing anything in and I was drinking all the milk and eating all the food, it was a stressor for him. And for a lot of families, that is the reality, that many families are living on the brink. And truth be told, they love their loved ones. They want to welcome them home but they don't have a place for them to live. They can't afford to feed another mouth. And so it's a stressor. And so we, we do discharge planning on, on the, on, in the jails. And for the state facilities, we do discharge planning through video conferencing and letter writing. So we connect people, we stay connected with people when they go upstate so that they know we're gonna be available to them when they come home. We pick people up. And this was something that happened under Marty Horn, the former commissioner of, of corrections, where he said, we have been, he have, Department of Corrections has been thinking about how do we take people from Rikers and bring them back to the community and drop them off. It was in Queen, Queens Plaza. He said, what if we brought people into our facilities where we didn't say you have to wait until we drop them off for you to engage with them. We will invite service providers to get clearance, to be working with people while they're inside, and when people are ready for release, they can put them in their van and take them directly to the programs, or they can take them directly to their appointments, their medical appointments, or take them directly to social services. And so ever since that time, that has been an element that we add. We have a couple of vans, we go and we pick people up when they're ready to get discharged, and we bring them into our service center, and we bring them into our community. We provide counseling and crisis intervention for people. Many times when people walk into our doors, one of the first things we say to people is welcome home and welcome to fortune. And for a lot of po people, that is a shock. And people question what's going on because they just came from an environment where people aren't that engaging. People, you don't really, you don't really engage like that. And so in our low threshold model, we welcome people home into our community. And we start with the very basic. When was the last time you had a meal? If it's winter, do you have a winter coat? Do you have clothes? Do you have a place to sleep? Do you have medical insurance? The very basics. And when someone comes in, if they don't have those things, we engage immediately. We don't send them someplace we have a continuum of services. So we get them connected to our care management unit, which helps people get connected to a primary care physician, helps people get connected to um, medical benefits. And we have a benefits assistance program that helps people apply for public assistance, help people apply for food stamps, apply for social security if that's what they need, help them get legal counsel, Whatever it is they need, that's what happens when they first come in. Food is a big thing. With the benefits, as I said, we do social security disability and connecting people to um, public assistance. Another big piece, and we've had some progress on this as a, as a state, not as much as we need, is around family services, family reunification. Many of the men coming home and women coming home, come home with huge child support arrears, which do a couple of things, right? One, 
is it drives them in the off the books market because if they get a job, the recoupment of the amount of money they have is going to be overwhelming and they can't survive. So they go and they try to find jobs off the books. And what else does that do? It means that they don't get a chance to see their family and engage with their children and be in their children's lives. So we created a family services unit that allows people, we have an attorney that helps people renegotiate their child support arrears, helps renegotiate um, child visits. We provide parenting classes because for many of our folks, their parenting experience was the experience they got from their parents. And we're at an age now where we're seeing fathers and sons and daughters in prison together. So we help them uh, with those family dynamics. Another pillar of reentry is housing. And when we first started, we didn't do housing. We used to connect them to the city shelter. And what we realized is what a way to create dysfunction, more dysfunction in someone's life than to send them to a shelter. And so we created housing, emergency and transitional housing, which is an amazing program. And if any of you are in New York, I would encourage you to come up and to see our housing models called Fortune Academy. It houses right now about 80 men and women who are all formerly incarcerated, all homeless, in emergency and transitional housing programs. And we define it as a program first that includes housing. We require 35 hours of productive activity, school, job, therapy, whatever it takes for you to be economically um, stable. We provide, we require 10 hours of community service, meaning that you have to give back you have to give back to the Fortune Academy community or you have to give back to the larger community. And we require three meetings, an AM meeting, a meeting to sort of open the day, a PM meeting, a meeting to close the day to talk about how everyone's day went, the struggles, the successes. And then we have the community meeting, again, what Judge Lippman talked about, where they get to meet with me, our CEO, our founder, and the senior director of that program, and we get to hear how their transition is going and offer support as a community. The other amazing thing that we do is we ask people to take off their jackets, the jackets that allow them to survive prison, to be vulnerable, to begin to trust, to begin to expose who you really are and what you're going through and how you are experiencing it. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing journey. Um, so I would encourage y'all to come up and look at that. We have education, everything from literacy on up to the uh, GED. Employment services. We do soft skills, uh, three week soft skills workshop, helping people prepare resumes, look for strategic job opportunities, handshake and a smile, the, the little things that will get you in the door and get you into a job. We have that and then we have two year job retention. Once you find a job, we stick with you for two years where we're following up with you. We're giving you transportation incentives. We're calling you back in to find out how the job is going, giving support to the employer. And then we added hard skills because we realized that for many of our folks, they were coming home not being able to be competitive. So we offer hard skills training, culinary arts, transportation, CDL license, construction, environmental remediation. We offer those kinds of skills so people can go out and be competitive. We have a huge alternatives to incarceration program where we see about 400 people that we divert from the city jails and from state prisons. And it's funded, one of, one of our programs are funded by Liz's um, uh, organization. We provide food and nutrition. And this was something that we have not done. We, we didn't do food, because um, we didn't really think about it, but we did a survey. Uh, we do an annual survey with our participants. And we found out that many of our participants 
weren't coming in, they weren't having access to fresh vegetables, they weren't eating. And so what we, what we did is we built out a hot meals program. So everybody who comes in for services every single day, they get a nutritious breakfast, they get a hot lunch, and they can get a hot dinner. We have a, a full-time nutritionist on, on board. We follow New York City's strict food guidelines with respect to salt and all of the rest of that stuff. So we introduce healthy eating to our participants. And then we do a food distribution program where we give out fresh vegetables that have been grown by local farmers. Uh, and we do a cooking demonstration to show people how they can incorporate those vegetables into their family uh, diet. We offer health services for people who are HIV, who have HIV or AIDS or chronic health conditions, where we provide case management, connecting people to care, making sure they are taking their medications, making sure that they are taking care of themselves. We have licensed outpatient mental health treatment, helping people sta stabilize. And that has been a really uh, fascinating process of implementing that program. We thought that we were gonna have, as you know, the kind of stigma in the black and brown community around mental health you know, people say, I'm not crazy. And what we found is that when you provide that service in a safe community, transparent about what you're doing, people really engage in it. And you'll walk through our halls and you'll hear people say, hey, I'll be right back. I got to go see my therapist. There is no shame in going to access those services because what we did is normalize how those services get provided. They are not something special. They're not different doesn't mean that you are not right. Uh, and people have really engaged in that. We have a licensed substance abuse treatment program. So people who have substance use issues, we engage them in treatment. And then we created and formalized our policy work through the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy. And David Rothenberg is our um, founder. So what has been our impact over the, over the, the time since providing these services? Well, last year we served over 7,200 people, walked through our doors and engaged in services. We provided 42,000, over 42,000 nutritious meals where people were able to get a meal and be part of the community. We provided over 3,000 individual therapy sessions to over 400 of our participants. We placed over 500 individuals in jobs that are paying over $15 an hour. We provided 19,000 instructional hours to help people gain some stability in education. And most of our folks come in at the sixth grade reading level. We save taxpayers of New York City and New York State over $12 million in jail and prison costs through our diversion programs. That now, instead of spending it on a jail cell for a prison or sending it, spending it on a jail cell for the city, the city could do something and reinvest that, that resource. We have a 72% successful completion rate in our alternatives to incarceration program, which means people are getting a non-custodial sentence at the end of their uh, diversion program. We provided individual and group discharge planning services to over 1,800 people incarcerated in New York City jails. We provided substance use treatment to over 700 participants, with 65% of them discontinuing use and remaining in recovery. We connected over 200 participants living with HIV and AIDS to medical care. 81% of our transitional housing participants successfully moved to permanent housing. And this is one of the real exciting things about our work is that the housing we've been doing. Uh, thanks to Liz, she's not here, but thanks to Liz, we were able to replicate our housing model in Syracuse with an organization called Center for Correctional Alternatives. And they are now opening up an emergency transitional and permanent housing project serving vulnerable and low-income uh, people from that community and people returning from jail and prison. Our policy, we have had major success on our policy front. 
We have been part of the Close Rikers campaign, the Lipman Commission, to bring about the closure of Rikers in partnership, and this is really exciting, in partnership with the Immigrate, Immigrant Defense Project, we successfully launched One Day to Protect New York, which is in New York, someone uh, arrested for a misdemeanor that is facing one year, whether they get sentenced to it or not, but they're facing one year. If they are uh, facing deportation, that charge alone triggers notification to immigration for deportation. And so what we have been advocating for is to change the sentencing structure on a misdemeanor from 365 days to 364 days. That one day change changes the statute on um, mandatory notification and mandatory deportation and it was called One Day to Save New York, and we are tremendously proud about that. We have used legal strategies to bring about systematic change with big employers. So we sued Target. We had a class action suit and sued Target for employment discrimination because they was doing broad employment discrimination without doing and looking at people with um, specific needs, they was doing broad discrimination. They settled that uh, agreement and now are looking for people who are injured by their practice and they are offering them uh, jobs or they are settling with $3.7 million to um, give the injured parties some compensation for their injury. Two recent uh, successes, one has been we sued a landlord in Queens for housing discrimination using the 1964 Civil Rights Act and using disparate impact, saying that when in fact you discriminate against the criminal justice population for a criminal record, because people in the criminal justice system are primarily African American and Latino, people of color, which are the protected class, you are in fact violating that Civil Rights Act. And we sued the landlord. We just, um, they just agreed uh, to the terms of a settlement. They are not acknowledging wrongdoing, but they are saying that they're gonna change all of their policies. So we're putting together a policy brief that we're gonna be sharing with landlords across the country. Uh, the Supreme Court a number of years ago upheld that legal framework so it's now opening the door for other providers and advocates to bring suit against landlords, housing providers who violate that act. Uh, so we are really excited about that. And then we had pardoned, I mean, we have advocated to Governor Cuomo to increase his pardon power for people facing immigration deportation. And last year, we, he issued 26 pardons which has been amazing because he has not been great on this issue, but he is getting better. Um, we successfully advocated for the right for people to vote. So Governor Cuomo signed a temporary pardon for people on parole, and that allowed 24,000 people who are on parole in New York City to be able to vote. So from, from an agency perspective, from a reentry perspective, our model, our goal, is to always, always be as holistic as you can. Always provide, um, let me just, always have um, the, the needs of the men and women who are walking through your door in mind, meaning that they should be at the table as you're formulating the service. So here's the takeaways, right? Programs should make a lifetime commitment uh, to people when they come home. The commitment shouldn't just be to the time that they're receiving services. People should know that they have access to you even when they're doing well and you should encourage them uh, to come and be part of your program. Your reentry programs must have a diverse staff. As I said, over 50% of Fortune's staff are formerly incarcerated and for many of them, 
when people walk through our doors, they see the people they serve time with, they see the people who they were on the streets with, and they see them doing well. It really provides um, motivations. And then reentry programs must articulate operating principles about how the work gets done. At Fortune, we have a couple of them, and I said it earlier. The crime is what you did, it is not who you are. None of us are the worst thing that we have ever done. And here's something that is really, for me, the thing that changed my life, beside education. We see the beauty in people sometimes before they see it in themselves. Somebody seen the beauty in me when I came home. I can't tell you how many people told me no when I was looking for a job. I can't tell you how many people told me you have to have the experience, but didn't want to give me the opportunity to get the experience. And when I came to Fortune, Joanne Page gave me that opportunity. She seen something in me that I was building, but she seen it and she gave me a chance. And as Stephanie said, today I'm the executive vice president of Fortune, a $35 million organization serving 7,000 men and women, over 300 staff, have a range of services, and really helps people build their lives. When you hold on to the image of who people can be, and you see people for what's best in them, when you really see people for what's best in them, we can figure out the rest about how to get them services about how to get them connected and stay connected. But it has to start with seeing the best in people. So thank you.